Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My Angular Story. This week, we're talking to Stephen Fluin. Stephen, do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Now, you have an interesting role on the Angular core team. I'm going to let you go ahead and just uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Google, and then we'll kind of move ahead from there. Sure. So uh, I am a developer advocate on the Angular team here at Google. Um, and so that it's a bit of an interesting job title because it doesn't exist at a lot of companies. But uh, my role really has two parts. The first part is to help developers and organizations be successful with Angular. Uh, and second is to reflect the needs of those developers and, and uh, understand what it's like to actually build apps in the real world uh, onto the team so that we can make sure that we're making the right sort of product decisions uh, as we continue to build out Angular. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I go to a lot of conferences. I talk to a lot of our ecosystem partners. I talk to uh, companies that are using Angular big and small. Uh, and I build things with Angular. Nice. It, it's always interesting to hear, too. I'm, I, I've talked to a number of uh, developer advocates or evangelists or you know people in that kind of a position and it's funny to me how many of them um, don't really do any development with it anymore, right? They just go out and talk to people. And I'm like, well, that's nice, but the way that we're doing software changes. So it's good to hear that you you do the development. Oh, yeah. I, I spent six hours over the last 24 hours uh, fighting with uh, SQL commands and... Uh, build system issues with uh, a small little TypeScript script I was trying to compile. So I, I try to be in the weed of thing in the weeds of things as much as possible. Nice. And we've we've had you on a few episodes. Um, I know we had you on episode one hundred and one, um, where we talked about what was coming in Angular two. That was what like two years ago, and then um, episode one hundred and eighty, which just came out a few weeks ago. You know, talking about you know, what, what's coming in Angular th these days. So, yeah, it's, it's nice to get you on and just kind of get a read on what's going on. Absolutely. So I, I kind of want to go way back uh, to the, the first experiences you had with programming. H how did you get into programming? So my story about how I got into programming really started when I was eight years old. Um, it was kind of random and arbitrary. but So I was in the, the car with my father, on the way to a baseball game. It was the, the Minnesota Twins. And that morning I had spent playing a couple of computer games on my, my really, really, really old PC. Um, and I, I was asking my dad, like, where do games come from? And then he was like, oh, somebody makes those. And I'm like, wait a minute, you can make these things? Like humans did this? How, how does that work? And so I, I kind of asked question after question after question. Um, I probably didn't even, I, I have no recollection of the baseball game, but I, I remember discovering this world where you as a, a, a person can actually build software that other, someone else is going to use. I, I don't even think I knew it was software at the time. Um, but then after we got back, uh, he ended up buying me, I think it was the Borland Turbo C programming book. So I, I started my programming journey uh, learning C++ and C. Uh, just trying to make things show up on the screen, kind of like hello world or like prompt something and then uh, respond or building like little quizzes and things like that. Awesome. That's awesome. So so did you get to build some games or have, have you kind of worked in other areas for most of your programming? 
No, no. So I, I did end up building a, a few games. So, so I mean, that was all I really cared about as a kid. And so it, that was where I, I spent a lot of my time. Um, I built a, if you've ever heard of a MUD or a multi-user dungeon, uh -huh. uh, or it's a text-based role-playing game, uh, I ended up building a, a really simplistic one uh, um, called Troll Attack that was entirely, it, it was built entirely in C++. Uh, the entire world was 16 by 16 because I didn't know how to kind of arbitrarily assigned memory so i just had a, a multi-dimensional array and then there were like trolls in there and it was all synchronous so you couldn't do anything while the game was playing like you'd say you'd type like kill troll and it would just wait until the the fight was done uh, and then it would tell you how you did so that that was my my first set of programming and then i, I did get a little bit more sophisticated in time so uh, over time so in high school um I, I started doing my first, uh, that was kind of where I first discovered the web. So uh, I created my own independent study class with the, uh, one of the teachers because they didn't really have much uh, programming in my school. And so I was setting up my own Fedora boxes and I was mm. learning PHP for the first time uh, because the, the web by then had become a thing. And I was like, hey, this is a much better interface than the command line. Right. <laughs> nice. So, so it was in, in high school that I, I learned uh, PHP, HTML, uh, kind of the start of CSS, although we didn't have a ton of CSS back then. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to college, uh, I got the more kind of formal computer science uh, learning and understanding. And it was actually then that I, I revisited Troll Attack um, and, and I rebuilt the entire thing in Java. I added features. I added like this whole XML-based uh, build system so you could uh, kind of build out the world as you were going. Uh, and that, that thing ended up being like 30 or 40,000 lines of code, actually. Nice. I've, and I've, I, I think you can actually even still visit it today. Let me just click uh, quickly type uh, NC for netcatrollattack.com on port 4000. Let's see if it's still up. It is still up. My, <laughs> my old mod that I built in Java is still online. Wow. Yeah, I, I guess I've always had this idea that it'd be fun to build... Um, games but i have never actually gone out of my way to do it so yeah i, I don't know it's something about uh a game like where there's there's rules there's a system in place it, it's always just fit perfectly in my head as, as something that it's very straightforward fun to do uh as a programmer as a developer yep well i've been listening to ready player one again and so you know all all of the gaming and um, geek culture stuff that's in there also kind of gets me interested in that. So, oh, yeah. I mean, like, like I, I love Ready Player One, but the thing that they don't touch on that, that I maybe maybe someday I should write this book uh, is Ready Player One, where you, your ability to program ends up determining like your effectiveness and how you relate to other people. Like it, a little bit like uh, Snow Crash, if you've ever heard of that book. Um, I haven't, but. Um, so, so imagine the oasis where if you wanted a car, you could buy one or you could build your own, right? Right. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, there's, uh, there are some uh, fantasy books that I've read. We're going way off on a tangent now. But uh, that wh where the magic kind of is kind of like programming, you know, where you, you either, um, you know, put specific words or characters or runes or glyphs or something in a specific order and then it does something um, or things like that, you know, where where there are specific and finite rules to what you can and cannot do. And, you know, the, the limitation really is just your creativity and how you put all that stuff together. Yeah, finite inputs, infinite outputs. Yeah. That's kind of how I like to think about programming. Yep. And, yeah, I mean, there, there are an infinite number of things well maybe not but to my mind anyway there are an infinite number of things you can do with code and so it's interesting i sure, I, sure. I am curious uh how did you get into javascript then how did you get into so, javascript and angular yeah so after, after high school and into college I, I was building a lot of websites um actually started a company um on, on the side and then i i was uh, working for a company as well um where a lot of the work that we were doing was was building out web applications, so uh, Java, .NET, PHP, that that sort of thing. Um, and then for for some personal need, I, I had this like data table, and I wanted to add a, a search feature. And like typically, you have you build a little input box, and when you hit submit uh, at that time, the page would reload, and you'd render all the items matching the search. 
And I found out that uh, there, there was this uh, JavaScript library called data table that you just type and then it filtered in real time. I'm like, oh my God, you can do this on the client side? Um, and then very shortly after that, I, I discovered AngularJS where for the, the first time, instead of having to do a whole post back to the server, uh, I could really do anything that I wanted with, with user input. So I, I, I fell in love with this idea of uh, ng model and just adding kind of taking these pages that I've been building uh, in this older way uh, and bringing all that code or bringing a lot of that code into the client side so that I could build a, a better experience. And so that, that was my, my first touch of AngularJS was search and filtering uh, in real time with what a user type. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, um, you know, I did a bunch of stuff with Backbone and that was, oh, this is really nice because all of the mess that I get with, you know, the way I write jQuery, now I can, you know, I, I can organize it nicely. And then I hit Angular and it was like, oh yeah, you know, this will allow, yeah, what basically what you said, you know, where it's, hey, you know, now I can do all of these other things with the user input before I send it to the server and I can get all of the reactions I wish I could before in the DOM. And it just, it opened up a whole bunch of options for me that I didn't realize that I had been missing. Yeah, and, and I mean, for me, there was a spectrum, right? So back with AngularJS, first I added a feature. I'm like, hey, this this feature would be really clients. I'd like that, that's searching and, and filtering. Uh -huh. um, and then I, I, I kind of progressed because this stuff is addicting, right? You're, you're building these, these real-time experiences. So then I, I started moving from just a feature to an experience. So yeah. I, as part of my blog, I had this whole kind of custom editing environment. And so I built that editing environment entirely in AngularJS and they would post back to the server and whatnot. Um, but then I, I, I got to a point where I'm like, why am I doing half of this coding in PHP, half of this coding in JavaScript? Uh, and so I, I was starting up another company at that time and I was like, hey, let me, let's just build a database layer, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's in server side technologies. It just gives me JSON. Uh, and then I'll use Angular to actually handle the routing, to handle the rendering so that every click is instantaneous and it feels very app-like. Um, and so that was a, an app that I actually shipped uh, across the web. I, I was building it as a, a Chrome app at the time. Um, but because it was just AngularJS code, I also shipped it as uh, an Android and an iOS application. So that, that was the first time where this idea of a, a fully single page application built on top of a JavaScript framework really, really clicked for me in terms of uh, an experience that was app-like, but using uh, a technology, that, the web technology and the web platform that, that made a lot of sense to me, felt like it was flexible enough, powerful enough that, that I could build an experience and then ship it in front of uh, my users' eyeballs, no matter what screen they were using. Yeah, that that's interesting because, uh, you know, I kind of got my start with Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails, and there's a lot of discussion now around, you know, when do I need something like what you're talking about, where you, you build the experience on the front end versus, you know, you build out the experience on the back end and then enhance it with something on the front end. You know, so you, you pull in then your uh, your um, Angular or React or, you know, whatever other framework you're using at the, at the moment. And, and yeah, there, there's a big discussion around that because then it's what's the role of the current skill set that I have. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like it, what's really funny is if I look across my, my entire uh, history, I, I've had these different like where I always have a, a duo or a trifecta of languages. Right. So uh -huh. early in my days. Um, it was like PHP and HTML. And then I, I loved this idea of building kind of more desktop richer experiences or, or even building servers. And so that, that my servers were Java based. Um, and then I would use something like Python for, for desktop experiences. So for a while it was Python, Java, PHP was my trifecta. And now with, with kind of the advances in Node and Angular, uh, it's my, my, all three are kind of Java, or excuse me, JavaScript, 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 right? So if I'm building a desktop application, I'm probably gonna use JavaScript, um, build an Angular, ship it in Electron. If I'm building a web-based experience, it's gonna be Angular, it's gonna be a mm -hmm. client-side app with a yep. great user experience. And if I'm building it as a server, it's gonna be JavaScript in Node. And so uh, I, I still, I, there, there's things I really like about Java, um, Everyone, uh, a lot of the, the listeners are kind of cringe, but I still, there's a lot of things I like about PHP in terms of how it was really designed for the medium it was used in, like 
there, there were a bunch of methods that made it really easy to ship web code, uh, even if you were ultimately shipping bad web code. Um, but e even with, with those kind of languages still being strong in a lot of places, uh, it, it's now better for me to ship JavaScript everywhere. That's interesting. And yeah, I, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to just, you know, figure out, you know, is that the way that things are going to continue to go? Because it seems like uh, in a lot of ways that's where things are going now. But it seems like also then at some point a lot of things, you know, we wind up seeing some level of disruption to, to that. So things will start heading one way and then we get something new and we'll wind up somewhere else. Sure, sure. I mean, like... Uh I think about this a lot in terms of are, are we reinventing the wheel, right? Like, so we've yeah. had the same sort of problems and we, we've had solutions for these problems for uh, a long time in the, the PHP, Java, and .NET worlds. Um, and so are we reinventing things unnecessarily just because of what I call kind of tech fashion? Uh, I, I really don't think so, though. So, I mean, I, I think what's happened is there, there's been a few kind of pendulum swings back and forth between client side and server side mm -hmm. that, that are driven by fundamental technology concerns. And so, for example, I mean, it, when computers first started, everything was uh, mainframe based, right? So you would right. have a time shrink. Everything was server side because uh, getting this sort of computing power uh, was expensive. And then we had the the PC revolution and um, the the web became a thing, and so uh, or excuse me, we had the PC revolution before the web became a thing, and so it made sense to build everything client side. So, so we shifted from server side to client side, and then the web took off, and we we shifted server side again, right? So this was uh, kind of the the first days of the web where I, everything you wanted to touch was a, a get request, a post request um, to a typically a static server or or some sort of custom uh, backend, mm -hmm. uh, and now we're seeing that. Uh, where we're swinging back to the client side, or we have been since kind of 2004, getting closer and closer to the client side because uh, the net is great because we we have this instant connection to the most up to date information anywhere in the world, but it's slow, right? These network connections they they keep getting faster, but they're they're not getting faster at the rate in which our usage is increasing, and our our adoption of these technologies is increasing. So uh, we're, we're I mean, definitely in a, a world today where a client side experience is better. I can see us swinging back server side if we have pervasive, ubiquitous, reliable, high speed internet connections. Uh, but I, I don't know when that happens. Does that happen in five years, 20 years? Uh, because, I mean, ultimately, there, there's no reason it has to happen on my computer if I have that connection. Mm -hmm. I could just have a view. Uh, that shows up on any screen that connects back to some VM somewhere. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. Um, I also wonder, though, how much of, you know, you're talking about having a reliable internet connection, but how much of that is the fact that we're doing a lot more on our phones. And so, you know, when we're out and about, you know, the the 4G or 3G, you know, can you know, even when we get high latency, it can cause us problems. And, and that that causes a lot of the issues that you're talking about here where, you know, the Internet connection just isn't great. And it's not necessarily because we don't have high speed connections wherever we're at. It's that we don't have high speed connections everywhere we're at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, and you were talking about disruptors, and I, I think there are some disruptors already kind of at play. And I mean, I, I've been calling it JavaScript, but for for a lot of developers now and a lot of companies, uh, TypeScript is is absolutely the way they go because they they find that it's easier to write in terms of expressing intent and understanding. But but almost more importantly, it's easier to read and maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, where if you've got three levels of asynchronous indirection. Uh, the typing system is going to tell me exactly what I'm getting back where, and I don't have to like think back and say, okay, have I unwrapped this the right number of times from asynchronous events, things like that. Uh, and so TypeScript, I, I feel like, is a very natural evolution that gives us some of, doesn't reinvent the wheel in terms of some of the technologies and the capabilities we've had in the past, but just brings them to JavaScript in a way that it's very uh, friendly, right? Like I, when I, I love writing TypeScript. But I don't always use, like uh, don't don't tell the rest of my team. But I don't always put types on everything, right? I, I use it. No, <laughs> I know. I, I try and express intent where something might be confusing, something might be unclear, um, 
And, and obviously, when I, I'm working on larger projects or working with the team, I, I use it everywhere I follow our coding standards. Uh, mm-hmm. But for personal projects, I use it as needed, so to say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are actually really surprised when they find out that you, you don't have to write TypeScript to use Angular. The, the only places Angular requires it are for our uh, decorator syntax, which is uh, pretty Angular specific anyway, mm-hmm. although uh, I think uh, Vue has it uh, as an option as well, uh, and dependency injection. So that, that means that outside of the signature of your constructors, uh, you can just write ES5 all day if you want to. Uh, but I, as I said, there, there's a very natural, like, I want to opt in because I'm going to write better code. And uh, But even if I don't, the, the TypeScript compiler is going to infer things and give me help and guidance and tooling in my IDE. Yeah, the, I think that the concern there comes in, and again, we're getting off on a little bit of a tangent here, but... Um, I think a lot of the concern comes in that most of the examples, most of the documentation, most of the things that would make, um, you know, Angular easier to get started with are all done in TypeScript. And so Mm -hmm. to learn to do it in ES6 or, um, you know, some of these other systems, it just it gets a little bit hairy because there's nobody out there actually showing me how to do it that way. Sure, sure. And I mean, I, I, and we're back on Angular now more than, more than my story, but one of the, the challenges we have is, do you teach someone the easy way or the right way? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's totally a fair question. And uh, yeah, I, I, don't re- I don't really know if we know the answer to that. And it, I think it's one it, we struggle with, but we, we tr- I think we in general, we err on teaching it the right way. So like, for example, yeah. if you do ng-new, we're going to give you spec files, right? We're going to give you tests out of the box. Uh-huh. Uh, with the, the with you can totally turn them off. You can do dash dash spec equals false. Um, but if you default to them off, no one's ever going to learn that way. Right. So I, I'm curious, going back to your story. Um, so were you hired to work at Google on the Angular team, or did you kind of come to that in a different way? No, no. So yeah, a, a recruiter reached out to me. This is a bit of a funny story too, where a recruiter reached out to me and they they said, hey. Uh, are you interested in, in looking at roles at Google? And I, I was like, uh, I just joined another company at that time, so it wasn't the right time. And I'm like, uh, I'll check back in a couple months. And so three months later, they ping me and I say, well, what's the job? And they say, it's confidential. And I'm like, it's confidential. Well, now I have to interview. I have to figure out what this role is. Uh, and so I, I go through the entire interview process. Uh, and then I find out that the role, it's, it's not confidential at all. It's, it's the most public role it could be. It's a, a developer advocate on the Angular team. Uh, but by then, I, I've kind of uh, I've talked to the team. I, I fall in love with the role, and I'm like, sure, uh, I'm in. Let's let's do this. I think it's funny when recruiters pull that. It's confidential. I can't tell you. It it totally worked on me, right? Like a yeah. confidential role at Google. Who, who who would ever turn that down? Yeah. See, for me, it's a major turnoff. Oh, you're not going to tell oh, really? me who who the company is or or what I'm going to be doing there. Oh, I, I knew no, the company. Fine. I didn't yeah. know the the role though. Yeah, that helped. Yeah, if, if you don't know the company, it's it's kind of like, oh, this is probably a scam. Yeah. Well, I've, I've had a few recruiters tell myself or people that I'm coaching, I coach people to help find jobs. It's one of the things that I, I do sometimes. And yeah, they're like, well, I can't tell you the company because you might just go apply on your own and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there going, well, then how do I know if I want to go through the trouble of doing the interview? <laughs> But yeah, yep, no, it's 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 a challenge. I, I think in general, the, that's still kind of an unsolved space is how do you find the, the right people for a company and how do you find the, the right jobs for people? Yep. I, although lots of people are trying. Yep, absolutely. So so what have you done um, for the Angular team then? I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, in this role, do you contribute code much or is it mostly the, the outreach and scheduling and planning and working with, you know, conference organizers and things like that? Sure. So uh, I would say I write, I build more Angular apps than I uh, build Angular. So I, I am a contributor to Angular repo, uh, more so on kind of the, the doc side of the things. Uh, I, I haven't uh, been modifying kind of the, the guts or the internals of Angular, uh, but I, I do build a lot of applications with Angular. Um, and then I, I've been involved in uh, a lot of uh, kind of our strategic planning. So if, if you recall back when we clarified the, the names of things, for example, I, I was heavily involved in, in that process trying to uh, reduce as much as possible a, a very confusing 
uh, naming situation. Yep. That makes so sense. So you, you, can, you can blame me for some of that. <laughs> there we go. I hate that they called the components. <laughs> or I don't oh, know. Oh, no. I, I mean more about the, the AngularJS Angular clarification. Oh, yeah. where we had people saying things like, oh, I'm upgrading from AngularJS 1.4 to AngularJS 2 version 5. Like that, that was a mess. We, yeah. we had to solve that. <laughs> Well, and that's that's funny too because I still have people, you know, they they you know, as I talk to people who aren't familiar with that particular naming convention, they still say Angular one and Angular two, even though we're almost to six, I think. Yeah, and and as long as the intention is clear, I mean, what you call it doesn't yeah. matter. Although we 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 try very hard to help people with those, and I, I would say it's it's actually gotten a lot better over the last year. So I mean. In the beginning, there was no naming guidelines. There was no clarification. At all. Everyone was coming up with names, whatever they, they wanted to call it is what they called it or what they heard they kind of repeated. Yeah. Um, but we, we tried to standardize on some terms that, that accomplished a couple of things. Uh, one that would be future-proof. So as we continue to add numbers and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, the names would stay valid. Uh, but then also we wanted, we actually looked at kind of across the internet, all of the books that were written, all the blog posts, and we tried to rewrite the least amount of history. Uh, and so AngularJS for the, the old thing, uh, was actually what most of the content was called, although there was a bunch of content that they called it just Angular at that point as well. Um, and then Angular for the new thing, because the, the versions, they're going to keep coming, but they, they shouldn't be a big deal. And I, I think most people have now uh, switched over. I'd say probably 60, 70% of the content I see uses names perfectly. Uh, new developers coming into the ecosystem, uh, they use the names correctly. Um, so that that's actually the, the, the kind of the biggest positive sign that if, if you haven't used these things before uh, and then you, you go to one of our websites, all the names are consistent. It's all clear kind of from the start. Uh, it's just people that have this, this kind of historical context where they heard about something three, four years ago. Um, and then uh, we, we use the new names and they, they get a little bit confused. But I, I see a half-life where uh, of all the people that use it wrong, uh, every time we do a release, about half of them figure it out and then half of them keep using it wrong. So uh, uh, we will eventually get to uh, everyone using the right names, I think. Yeah, one other thing that I've seen as far as that goes is just as we have conversations, uh, you know, on the shows and we talk about it and, you know, we dis distinguish between Angular and Angular JS, um, that also helps people. So as, as people get more involved with the ecosystem and talk to more other people in the ecosystem, you know, or listen to people like the folks that we have on the podcasts, uh, that a lot of that gets cleared up there as well. So, yeah. and I mean, just just having a standard, I think, helps too. Because yeah. before everyone was using every name, yeah, so having a standard means that if if you and I have ever talked about Angular before, we're probably going to use the the same terms now. Yep, yeah, exactly. And and that's really what it is: is it's shared vocabulary and essentially yeah. educating people. When we say this, this is what we mean. And so it's not a correction on them so much as we're clarifying the way that we talk about this so that we can all talk about the same thing at the same time. Yes. Um, some other things that I, I've built uh, in the Angular ecosystem, uh, I, I actually built the Angular update guide. So we, we had this tiny little, uh, it's, it's really not sophisticated at all, but it was a, a semantic uh, data set on top of our change log that tried to say, hey, uh, not just here's what we changed, but here's what you need to do to your app uh -huh. if you're coming from version X and going to version Y. I don't know if you've seen that before. I haven't, but it's it's helpful to have that kind of documentation out there, especially where people are wanting to move to a more modern setup. Yep, and that was uh, angular-update-guide.firebaseapp.com. Uh, and so like you, you put in, I'm going from version four to version five, two, and it says, Hey, rename this because we deprecated that in the past. Uh, then you have to do these things to uh, adjust for breaking changes or install the modules. And then here's new deprecations that you should go, that you should fix, uh, for the future, but you don't actually have to do it. And so it, it tries to break it down into those categories of things that you can do before the update, things that you have to do during the update and things that you can do later. Um, and so, uh, one of the, like, th this is, I think, a really useful guide for a lot of people. Um, but it's actually in version six, the need for it's going to be reduced somewhat because we, we now have the ng update command that it's going to be helping you with a lot of these things. Although I still think there's a place for it um, in terms of understanding the changes to your app between kind of two versions. Yeah, makes sense. 
So what are you working on these days? Uh, a lot of uh, ecosystem stuff. So talking to um, people that are building things in our ecosystem that, that make Angular developers' lives easier. So um, things like StackBlitz, things like NativeScript, um, trying to, to work with those folks, Webpack, trying to work with all these people um, in our community to kind of synchronize our efforts and uh, make the, the lives of Angular developers better. Mm -hmm. So I, I talked to the stack folks a, a lot. And so we were talking about, okay, how, how should open sourcing work? How can uh, importing from GitHub work? Uh, they kind of giving them our needs and our hopes for, for their roadmap and things like that. Cool. So uh, how does that work? I mean, what, what does your day typically look like? I mean, is it mostly just coordinating via email or are there other aspects of this that, you know, we as regular developers don't really think about or yeah so i mean it's uh a fair amount of uh email uh, i probably get I, I don't know i i still feel like it's it's relatively light but i probably get i don't know 70 80 emails a day that i, I have to actually act on um i'll probably have five or six meetings so meeting in person meeting via video chat um every now and then i'll i'll give a, a talk like this one or, or like our uh, Angular Mountain View meetup, which happens uh, every every month. Um, and then in the cracks in between there, uh, I'm, I'm building out apps. I'm trying out new features, um, demoing our, our betas, our RCs, et cetera, uh, and continuing to, to build out uh, other apps that I maintain for myself. Awesome. Well, the last segment of the show is picks. Uh, do you have some things you want to shout out about? For you, the listeners of My Angular Story, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Sure. Uh, so... Uh, I guess as a complete throwback, I will I'll, I'll throw out my trollattack.com uh, app. So so I think the website's actually down. I, I haven't checked, but if you if you have Telnet or Netcat, so if you're on a, a Mac, this is actually comes out of the box, and you just type NC, which is the command for Netcat, uh, space trollattack.com space four thousand. Uh, you can see that really old Java based mud that I built. Uh, hopefully it doesn't break. Hopefully it works, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe just a, a shout out to that that really uh, old timey app, uh, and then maybe uh, since you hadn't heard of it, the Angular Update Guide. Um, so the it's a, a web app where it tries to guide you through the uh, process of updating the latest version of Angular. Nice, very nice. All right, well, I'm going to throw out a couple of picks. So the first pick that I have is um, NGConf's coming up, and so these picks are going to center around that. I think this episode comes out around the week of ng-conf so um you know it'll give people some context um first of all um the theme for ng-conf is ready player one and the the 80s type theme so i'm i'm pretty excited about that um and i'm actually listening to the audiobook again so that i can go see the movie because <laughs> i'm excited for the movie as well. I just, I really, really enjoyed the book. So uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to pick that. Um, you can get the book. You can also get it on Audible. Um, and and that's awesome. Um, I listen to most of my books on Audible. So if you want to go check out Audible, you can. Um, if you go to devchat.tv slash Audible, I think you get a free credit uh, when you sign up. And so you can use that to get Ready Player One. Um, but it's, it's a terrific um, service. And so I really like that. Um, another thing with ng-conf, I'm doing something very similar to what I did with ng-atlanta. Um, so at ng-atlanta, I did interviews with 
the speakers. I'm still working on getting those up on YouTube. Um, I definitely will have them up before NGConf. So um, if you wanted to see, you know, what, what people were talking about and get a little more context on their talks, um, you can check that out as well. I talked to Brad Green while I was over at uh, NG Atlanta, and we just talked through some of the things that he announced and the, the things that he talked about in his talk. So um, if you're interested in any of that, go check that out. And, uh, I, yeah, like I said, I'm hoping to line up, uh, you know, just 10, 15-minute uh, discussions with the various speakers from NGConf and we'll get those out. So anyway, um, yeah, so those are my picks. Uh, you can go check all of that out at devchat.tv slash YouTube. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, Stephen, if people want to see what you're working on these days, uh, follow you on Twitter or anything like that. Um, yes. where, where do they go? Where do they find that stuff? Uh, yeah, to follow me on Twitter is probably the best way. So, uh, at Stephen Fluin, S T E P H E N. F L U I N. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe I'll see you at NGConf. Yep, I'm planning to be there, and hopefully, we'll see a bunch of you there. Um, I also just want to shout out that usually the Angular team is pretty approachable. So, if you want to talk to some of these folks, see what they're doing, or just kind of get to know them a little bit, uh, don't be shy. Uh, go talk to them. They're 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 pretty friendly folks. Yeah, no, and, uh, that is a great sentiment that I, I definitely want to echo. I mean, our our hope is that we are. Uh, part of the community, not a, a separate team, right? Like we, we are with you. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the feel that I've gotten over the years going to conferences and talking to folks, you know, I, I can flag just about anybody down on the angular team. And unless they're running off to something that they've already scheduled, they're perfectly happy to just talk to me for a few minutes. We sometimes use the term, uh, you can sit with us, which we really like. Yeah. I think you had t-shirts that said that one year. So Yes, and I, I think Brad still still wears it every time he keynotes. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, thanks for coming, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. All right, we will uh, wrap this one up, and we'll catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.